Welcome to uh, uh, CancerVax CEO Chats. Today I'm joined with uh, Raven, Raymond Veneri. Uh, Raymond, thank you very much for being here with me today. Thank you, Ryan, for asking me to join you. It's a pleasure. So I'm going to uh, start by just giving a little bit of your background, uh, a quick little bio. Um, Raymond uh, received a bachelor's degree from the School of Art and Science, the University of Pittsburgh, um, a master's degree in art history and museum studies from Case Western University, um, where he also was a, do a doctoral candidate and completed a fellowship at the Cleveland Museum of Art. I've been there, by the way. It's a, it's a great museum. <laughs> Very good museum. Yeah, Cleveland's kind of a fun city. It's a great city. Rock and Roll Hall, Hall of Fame, and I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's highly underrated. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and then, Raymond, you received a, another master's degree in business and ethics from uh, Duquesne University and a certificate in technology commercial, commercialization from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, yeah. I don't know how long it took you to do all of that, but but uh, you were busy. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> yeah, or my dad would say schizophrenic, one or the other, I'm not yeah. sure, but yeah, you follow your passion in life. And, and well, that's important, it, isn't it? It is passion for me and and science and technology were always at the center of my uh, center yeah. of my being when I was growing up. No, I think that's fascinating. Um, uh, Raymond, you have served as vice chairman at Guangzhou INDA Biotechnology in China. Um, I've been there as well. Uh, another <laughs> fascinating place. Um, you served as chairman and CEO of Siever, uh, Sievergenics. Correct. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yep. Yeah. Um, out of Pittsburgh and also on the board of directors of Sievergenics Technologies uh, in India, and now serve as the chairman and CEO of Predictive Oncology. So, yes. uh, Raymond, you've got over 30 years as of experience working in, in this field. You've been an accomplished um, and senior executive. Um, you've, uh, you've served on boards. Um, of different bio, biotechnology companies. You've, uh, you've built and managed companies on behalf of institutional investors and private investors and foundations and research institutions. And um, it, it's, it's quite impressive. Um, um, and, and you focused a lot on, on building companies, uh, corporate governance and uh, uh, commercialization of new technologies and uh, business eth ethics. And I think that's a laudable career. So. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so, on a personal level, yeah, I, uh, it it appears as though you live in Pittsburgh now. Uh, I do. Our uh, our primary laboratory facility and artificial intelligence facility is in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, we have a location in Egan, Minnesota, and a location in Birmingham, Alabama. A GM okay. facility in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic! Fantastic. Hey, now, did you grow up in Pittsburgh? Is this where you live most? Yeah. I, I'm I'm a native Pittsburgher. I traveled like most of us in life. Yep. I graduated from college, migrated outside the city, traveled yep. around a bit, and then ended up back in Pittsburgh a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So I've been I've been to Pennsylvania, of course, not to Pittsburgh. Um, I've been to Philly, but my wife and I have a little uh, a little uh, goal that we're trying to hit all of the Major League Baseball parks. So within short order, we'll we'll be there. <laughs> well, Ryan, you have to let me know when you do that. Pittsburgh is one of the best ballparks in the country. It really oh, does. I'm going to exaggerate. Uh, and it also has, if you're a fan of uh, Roberto Pimente, he's, uh, there's a Orson. small museum private uh, collection of his oh, personal no. memorabilia. Yeah. Oh, that would be fantastic. I am a fan of his, actually. We've, yeah. hit, we've, hit, uh, we've hit 15 parks already. And, um, and then I have a personal collection because I'm a baseball junkie. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I collect... Uh, autographed baseballs from the 500 club. So just guys who've hit over 500 home runs in their career. And, wow. and I'm about halfway done with that list right now of, of balls collected. And it's kind of a fun little hobby. Wow, that's a great hobby, actually. Have you been to St. Petersburg? There's a small baseball museum in St. Petersburg. Have, yeah. Thousands of signed baseballs. Yeah, it, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it appears, as I look through your resume, Raymond, that you've got a few different passions. You've got a passion for the arts. Um, you've got a passion for the sciences, um, a passion for history and art history. But making that jump in your in your studies from art history 
but then having, you know, the majority of your career focused on the biotechnology sector. Mm -hmm. I know you said you were always interested in the sciences, but, but how, how does one make that jump? I'm curious. Uh, you know, Ryan, it's not that uh, convoluted or, or that esoteric. The fact of the matter is I, I have, I've, I've always loved science. So it's always, even as an undergraduate, I studied uh, biophysics and, and, and uh, microbiology uh, and uh, fine art and art history as an undergraduate. I just, it was, you know, you go through that point in your life where you try to figure out who you want to be when you grow up. And I always just followed my passion. I, I never... I never thought of what I was going to do in life. I just focused on what I wanted to be in life. And I wanted to be well-rounded. I wanted to be educated. I wanted to be diverse in many ways. So I viewed undergraduate studies as a way to explore my own universe. Uh, but by the time I, I actually had, there was an inflection point where I had to decide, well, am I, am I going to go to medical school or follow the sciences or am I going to study fine arts? And there was um, this wonderful opportunity uh, at Case Western University, uh, Case Western Reserve University, where the Museum Studies Program um, had in their conservation department this opportunity to look at technologies at that time. You know, it was the forensic analysis of paintings to do the dating and uh, oh, to yeah. understand uh, what's real or not, what's not from a scientific point of view. One of my best professors at Case Western Reserve University, Dr. Ed Olszewski, was a PhD chemist who was in Florence after the 66 flood to try to reverse the uh, the chemical effect or the effects of, of the flooding on uh, on the paintings. And I found that absolutely fascinating. So when I was uh, at Case Western and and, in, and did a, the fellowship at Cleveland Museum of Art, I fell in love with the, te the imaging technology. I fell in love with the technology behind art history, the technology behind, uh, you know, uh, authenticating works of art and understanding works of art at a visceral level. You know, you, we tend to walk into a museum, see an object and fall in love with the object, but you, you don't really think about the fact that in the 15th century, there was a guy in a robe making his own paints and making his own brushes and uh, stretching his own canvas and choosing the right wood. I mean, these were, these were, these were craftsmen at, at, at every single level. And I fell in love with the exploration. So it was, think about it as archeology. span so I approached art history from an archaeological perspective. How do you unearth uh, um, what's actually behind the painting? So fast forward, I fell in love with technology. I left the doctoral program, yeah. took my master's, came back to Pittsburgh, and licensed the technology, or actually acquired a company in Pittsburgh. Uh, we can talk about how that happened, how a graduate student comes back to Pittsburgh and and purchases the company. <laughs> It'd be great for the, any of the entrepreneurs listening to this story. Um, and that was it was spun out of the out of uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and it was an image capture and analysis uh, company, or it was a company that was actually doing multimedia imaging. And I, you know, I thought that would be a really great uh, application for art history. That is to be able to. This is before the internet, before we had a asynchronous uh, distribution of images, before we had a robust system where you could uh, disarticulate packets and send it out across the country when bandwidth was not an issue. Uh, so I developed this company, it was called the Fine Art Inventory Network. It was based upon, think about, think of it as, um, I don't know, eBay for, for art, for, uh, for museums and for, for galleries, right? Yeah. Again, this was years before, uh, the delivery of that kind of service was available to the world. Uh, and in failing, because, you know, I came up with a great technology to capture the image and put the provenance together, but you couldn't deliver it because the, the internet hadn't been developed well enough yet. So I said, well, I now own a company. I have obligations. I need to find a client. And one of my first clients was um, a, uh, a company called Tissue Informatics. And they were doing image capture for pathology, high throughput, high throughput pathology for drug discovery. So I basically figured out how to adapt what I was doing for painting to a microscope to capture that, digitize it pixel by pixel. And uh, that company was acquired by another company and I became part of that uh, as senior vice president. Uh, and that my journey, and we began uh, back into the sciences was born at that moment, but it never, I still am involved in the arts, but I, I see very little difference. There's a lot of science in art and there's a lot of art in science. I would agree with that. No, I think that's very astute. 
And it's interesting. It, it, you're, it's a sign of a true entrepreneur when you have a business and an idea and, and you know you need to pivot or die. And uh, it's that pivot oftentimes that's the hardest to do, but it, it really is the sign of, of a good entrepreneur knowing, knowing how to take, you know, what you have pivoted into, into a different direction and, and, you know, there in, in lies the success. So well done. Very true. Well, well, thank you. I think that is true of most entrepreneur, entrepreneurs where they, you're forced to think differently about everything. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times people told me that something could not be done. Uh, or that it could not be done the way that I thought it could be done. But that's what differentiates uh, successful entrepreneurs from um, entrepreneurs who are just trying to get their idea, uh, bring their idea to life. That's great, and I applaud that. But if you're going to be in business, then other, it, you have to make it available to other people. And if you have to make it available, it has to be commercially viable. And if you're not helping someone else be successful, then you're not gonna be successful. So then you start thinking through all those things. So my success in business has always been by thinking outside of the box. Sure. Yeah, you have to do that. You know, much like yourself, um, I had good advice in my undergrad years. Um, I've always loved politics. And so I was a political science major, not, not, not believing that that was ever gonna be my end you know, that my destination, I was, I knew I also wanted to go to business school. It was really business I was interested in, but I was fortunate enough to just dive into to this world that I loved. And I loved my major. It was a lot of fun mm -hmm. for me. Um, and, and I quickly learned in, in, in my business career that, um, that regardless of the sector I was working in, whether it was software or oncology, every business needs a business person. In our world, we need science people, we need technical people and we need people to run the business. And, um, and, and I was fortunate enough to, to get introduced into the biotech world, you know, quite a long time ago, over a decade ago, fell in love with it. Um, and, and I'm able to use, you know, the, the, all of the business tools and training that I've learned and, and acquired to help build these science companies. And I always joke with my scientists because they're like, you're not a real scientist. And I say, well, wait, 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 yeah, I have a, I have a degree in political science. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, I love that. That's, that's great. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, it, 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 you're absolutely right that at some point, every business has a life cycle. Every business um, has uh, inflection points where you know that you're falling short and you need more knowledge. You need more domain expertise. You need more exposure, more vision, whatever those things are. And you have to bring it bring it to the table. Um, my success, if I have any success at all, it's because I surrounded myself uh, with people that were a lot smarter than I am, uh, but I just see things differently than they do. So I, I feel for, I feel not for, but I feel very privileged to be working with scientists, brilliant scientists and engineers who dedicate their life to, you know, the mating habits of a Drosophila for 30 years, uh, but then yeah. without even knowing, that's knowledge for knowledge's sake, right? But at some point when you do technology commercialization out of a, an academic or um, an R&D environment, it has to be commercially viable. And that's really where my focus it has been because I see so many wonderful things that could be and should be in the marketplace, but can't be either for a lot of reasons, I, either because IP wasn't possible because something was disclosed or because people didn't think through what it would actually cost to get into the marketplace or people thought the market was larger than it might be, whatever those things are. So um, the relationship I have with all of the scientists I've ever worked with, including the scientists I'm working with right now, is that I understand the business of science. I understand science, but I'm not a scientist. What I understand is the business of science. So my job is to enable them to be successful, to, to achieve their vision in terms of what they want their work to, with the place they want their, their uh, work to take in the, in the world after they're done with their research. Raymond, I think you've just nailed the perfect tagline here, the business of science. That, that's mm -hmm. very well said. Um, one, one, of, one of your skills, but I'd love to talk and I'm excited to talk about, uh, about predictive, but um, before we get there, um, one of your skill sets and, and, and some of your, even your studies as a student 
in, in uh, graduate school was uh, uh, technology commercialization. When, when I hear that, I, 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 my head directly goes to licensing technology from universities and research institutions. Um, I've been a part of that with the University of New Haven, Connecticut, and the University of Utah, and now UCLA, and a few other uh, UC, uh, UT Texas, Austin. And so I've licensed technologies from different universities in the science world. Um, is, is it, when 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 you talk about technology commercialization, is that is that the reference, or is it broader than that? Well, that is the reference. Uh, so I have advised, like you, I've advised universities, different universities. I've worked with Carnegie Mellon University. I've worked with the University of Pittsburgh. I've worked with Ohio State University, Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and when I say work with them, what I mean is I work with the, 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 the people in the tech transfer office uh, of these universities. As you well know, um, I think many people think that tech transfer offices are a profit center for universities, and they're really not. They're cost centers, yeah. right? What they do is aggregate the collective knowledge um, that's been being developed at the university and finds those gems that um, uh, are may be commercially viable and may justify intellectual property or the spending of, of uh, legal fees. Uh, people just don't understand the engine behind behind technology commercialization at the university level. So I've always had the pleasure of either working with the scientists before they even go to the tech transfer office and say, you, you know, the irony is in, in universities, it's publish or perish. Yeah, if yep. you're not publishing, you're not progressing within the university or and raising money to, to fund your own research, right? The irony is that when you get to the translational side, when you get to the commercialization side, when you get to the point where you actually want to, the university needs to monetize all of that development, um, it's about not telling anyone anything. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can't get the IP. So you have this dichotomous existence that these universities uh, are and burden that they're living under, where you tell everybody everything about what you're doing so that the university gets money and then don't tell them anything yes. until you get the IP. But 90% of the things, maybe more, maybe your, uh, maybe your experience, Ryan, is a bit different than mine, but more than 90% of the things that should be in the market aren't in the market because they were publicly disclosed before we had an opportunity to, to really explore the potential. And then it's about bringing money to the table, right? You have to bring investors to the table to do the tech transfer license. So it's all of that. It's helping um, it, researchers on the front end, and then it's helping the university on the back end. And every almost every one of my companies uh, was either, you know, words on a piece of paper or a novel idea that no one has ever thought about other than to do the research. That's the challenge. It is, and it's it's it's, a, it's it's tricky to get in front of those professors to say, "Great idea! Don't publish. Wait, just wait. Let's let's put a license agreement in place first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's file some IP first, and yeah, uh, it's it's tricky. It's that it, you know, just education, educating people. Um, you know, I don't I don't try to pretend that I'm a scientist, and I don't want scientists to pretend that they're even though they believe it in their hearts. You know, they do. They believe it in their heart. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread yeah. ever in the history of the universe, and it may well be. But if you can't, if someone can't buy it, if you're not helping a patient, if you can't differentiate yourself it stays in the university. And then a lot of that IP that they paid for just dies on the vine as, as IP uh, protection uh, dwindles. You know, this is a, a quick little aside, but the, the way that I got into the biotech industry was kind of strange because I, I, at first I was working for a venture capital firm and we made an investment in an idea out of a university. And that, that was my first experience into tech transfer out of a university. Um, so we successfully licensed this idea and, um, and we moved it forward and, and I, I ended up stepping in as a CEO and, and, and that was sort of the birth of my biotech career. Um, but, but I learned that something that was kind of interesting is I was building this little biotech business. I knew that I had to go raise capital and I could raise that capital to, uh, build a, a research lab and purchase equipment and hire a bunch of scientists it's really expensive to just even to get started before you can even run a single experiment. So, so what we did, and, I, and I'm sure that you have experience with this as well, and this is what I love about partnerships with universities, is we were able to leverage the assets and the infrastructure that the university had 
and put sponsored research agreements in place. And, and we could we could essentially operate as a very low cost biotech company without having to make any infrastructure costs on the front end. Um, and I, I just, and, and there's so many good ideas and so many smart people at these institutions, they don't know what to do with the ideas, right? They, their, their job is to, is to think outside the box in, in, in the world of science and come up with these, these great, brilliant, crazy ideas. And our job is to come in and figure out how to take them to market. And, and I love that, that partnership, you know? Yeah, and it's an important partnership. You bring, you bring great value with that perspective to universities. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is if they could do it, they would be doing it themselves. But it's also true that, uh, again, one of the ironies is that especially if you're a nonprofit uh, university or if you have a, you're a nonprofit university with a for-profit arm to it, there are only certain things you're allowed to do legally. Yeah. So threading that needle is, is very important and knowing very early on in that process, what you need to do before you get to the next inflection point is, is, is very, very important. Yeah. And it's people, you know, who understand how to do the translational side of things, get things out of the university and into the hands of investors and to justify it to investors and have investors yeah. believe in it. That's a very difficult uh, transition to make. It is, yeah. Spoken from someone who's been there before. <laughs> several times. <laughs> I'm excited to get to know about your current um, company, Predictive Oncology. I know you're using artificial intelligence and machine learning um, to enhance the drug development process. Tell, tell me a little bit more about Predictive and what, 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 gets, what gets you so excited about it? Oh my gosh, Ryan. I mean, it has every component of everything that I've uh, that has driven me intellectually and personally and professionally for years. Uh, working with brilliant people, doing something that hasn't been done before, uh, turning something around, you know, being in a situation where I could, I transitioned from the board of directors of Predictive Oncology to being the CEO of the company to basically reposition the company in the marketplace. Uh, but the, the real answer is, the truthful answer is, my mother, my father, my brother, my uncle, my grandfather all died of cancer. That's the truth. Yeah. And so years ago, when this started happening, uh, when this um, really treacherous slide starting to occur, it started to occur in my family, I basically put everything else aside. And I said, okay, this is the space. This is where I want to be. Let me try to figure out something. And because of that decision, you know, every decision you make in life pushes you in a certain direction. And then you're forced to make another decision, which forces you in another direction. I just made sure that the defining choice that I was making kept me on the path of oncology, right? Uh, it didn't matter to me. I'm totally agnostic about whether it's gene therapy, cell therapy, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, whether it's drug delivery, whether it's a, 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 a medical device, I don't care. What I care about is that it's in the oncology space and we're moving that, moving down that path to finding a cure, finding a diagnostic tool, finding something that's going to advance drug discovery and drug development. So in predictive oncology, that all exists. It existed before I got there. Um, so what we do at, at predictive oncology is utilize artificial intelligence, we utilize machine learning, we utilize active learning uh, to help pharmaceutical companies validate targets on the front end. So if you know about drug discovery and drug development, you know that almost all the risk is in the front end. It's finding those molecules or finding those compounds that may, if they move through preclinical, may become some kind of therapeutic or involved in a therapeutic drug delivery to a certain indication, whether it's breast cancer, brain cancer, lung cancer, whatever those things are. Highly complex. And most so, people don't understand just the complexity of the, of the discovery process. Oh, uh, and, and before you even get the molecule or the compound, there are years of research to get yeah. to the target. To right. even know whether the biomarker or the target is even viable. So pharmaceutical companies will spend hundreds of tens of millions of dollars for sure to get the targets. And then another tens of millions to a hundred million dollars to fail in phase one or fail in phase two. And those failures really are, have everything to do with variability of the patient. So when you're in a controlled environment, you know this, this is the business you're in. If, you know, when you're in a controlled environment in a laboratory, uh, you can control every aspect of that protocol. 
and you can convince yourself, not convince yourself, the science can convince you yet this, mo yes, this molecule uh, is efficacious, let's say for breast cancer. Okay, so you've done it in a controlled environment with no variability, meaning it's, it's uh, ex vivo, right? It's in vitro, it's, it's, it's something you can control in the laboratory. But the minute you go into, at the minute you introduce an animal or a human being into the process, the variability is just, you know, in, incalculable. So the reason I, I point that out is what we have, it's not our artificial intelligence that differentiates us or, or makes what we do valuable. It's that we have 150,000 tumor samples in our database, I'm sorry, in our, in our biobank, dating back 20 years wow. with drug response data related to it. So when we query a molecule and we challenge a molecule or challenge a compound, we can introduce the variability inherent okay. in the tissue so that we know with it, we're at 92% accuracy in the probability of whether or not a molecule or a compound or whatever we're asked to look at will actually make it through preclinical. Wow. When you take that, when you mitigate that kind of risk. That's huge. Uh, it, it's huge. When we did our proof of concept, it's called the pedal platform, which is a three-legged stool. It's, it's the... It's the act of learning, the machine learning. It's the, um, the biobank, which has all of the tissues in it. And we have a, a wet lab, we have a CLIA laboratory. So whatever the computer is telling us, whatever in silico models are being developed or implied, we can prove it in the laboratory. And so when we did our proof of concept, we, we um, basically did a retrospective analysis, a retrospective study, I should say, and proof of concept where we, uh, we, we could show that, again, within 92% accuracy, we could have predicted what the outcome of a certain drug might have been. And it's, that's especially important when you know that it's gonna fail, right? I, I, I just had this conversation yesterday um, with uh, two scientists, uh, one of which is uh, our uh, chief business development officer. Wouldn't it be great to get our hands on the drugs that have failed in phase three clinical trials and retrospectively, <laughs> retroactively, I think I know to determine yeah. whether or not that we could have determined whether that molecule, that target would have succeeded through phase of uh, phase one or not through preclinical or not. Uh, so I think we're going to pursue that because uh, it's not like it's a huge market to, that we want to play. And it's it, it, the proof of showing that uh, artificial intelligence combined with real science actually can produce actionable results that are pro prospective, right? And predictive is inc incredibly important. Oh, and, and super valuable. I mean, how much, do, how much do companies spend on a phase time and money on a phase two and a phase three that end up failing? And if you can predict that on the front end, that's just massive. Yeah, it, it certainly is. I can tell you that just the, the compounds, the, the drugs that we looked at, uh, several in particular, those drugs took probably anywhere between five, 10, 15, 20 years, pick one of the drugs. I'm just sort of, uh, you know, I'm just being uh, generalizing here. Uh, let's take the one that took five years and $20 million to get to a failure, to get to a no. We predicted that in 12 weeks. Wow. I bet it cost a little less for, for, for you to run that analysis too. Just a few bucks. <laughs> I, you know, so that's what it is. I mean, sure, do, are we going to make, it's not like we're making millions of dollars out of getting, uh, getting uh, the biopharma company to a no quickly. It's that we're saving them not only, well, it's three things. One is we're saving them the time and the pain of spending a lot of money to get to a failure that we already know is going likely to occur, likely to occur. The other is if they don't spend their money on that, they can spend it on another target, yep. right? And the third and is- that goes, And that goes back to time. Time. Right? You're spending your money, you're spending your time on something that you know is gonna work rather than something you know is already predicted to be a failure. Absolutely. And the, and the beautiful thing for us is that we're not telling them what the science should be. We're taking their science. We're just helping them make a decision. In a way, it's a we, what we do is decision support. We they ask us a question, we query a molecule or whatever it is they ask us to query, whether it's structure, whether it's 
um, formulation, whether it's uh, drug interaction or, uh, or, or drug response, whatever those things are that we're looking at. But they're not just targets, they're not just biomarkers, it's pipeline. Sure. What sure. we're doing yeah. is having that, being able to help them identify real pipeline that can move through develop from discovery through development. Uh, the other part of what we do in predictive oncology is we have a GMP facility in Birmingham, Alabama. So when you get the formulations and solubility, we yeah. can do that as well. So uh, when I said earlier that it just sort of encompasses everything that uh, has been interesting to me and is important to me in one company, it, it, it's absolutely true. It's yeah. absolutely true. What a brilliant thing. I'm, I'm excited for you. Um, I share your passion on the, on the side of oncology. Um, I think that all of us have, um, you know, people who are close to us, whether they're friends or family in your case, also in my case, who've been affected by, by cancer. That's also why I'm doing what I do. And, you know, we're fortunate to have partnered with UCLA and we're working on two different therapy programs. One is Ewing sarcoma. It's a rare bone disease, you know, cancer that principally affects children. Mm -hmm. uh, as a father of eight children, <laughs> that's a oh big, my gosh. big deal to me. <laughs> I care about these kids, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then we're working on a, on a vaccine. And, and, I, and I think that there could be a lot of overlap on, um, on you know, our two businesses and, and uh, the potential of working together. This, what we're trying to do is, is identify different markers um, <clears throat> and we can build antigens uh, in the form of a vaccine to inform the immune system to detect these, these markers early on and, uh, and let the immune system go to work to get rid of these tumors, you know, avoiding the, the, the need of, uh, of some of these very invasive treatment therapies that, that were really all we have today. Right, right. I mean, it is very true, Ryan. Uh, you know, it's, uh, immunotherapy has great potential. I mean, if you can train your own immune system to identify and mitigate disease. <clears throat> what a wonderful thing that would be. We've been trying to do it for decades, obviously. Yeah, yeah. You know, it just so happens one of the companies that I ran years ago was called Immunocyte. It was it spun out of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, actually the Hillman Cancer Center. Uh, and the sole purpose, we built the laboratory and the sole purpose of that laboratory was te to test the um, immunopotentiating uh, effects of certain drugs that were being developed for breast cancer in particular. The entire company was geared just to that one question. Fascinating. To that one question, yeah. Um, I, I understand you'll be at Bio in June. Um, so we'll we'll need to uh, offline connect and uh, see if we can't coordinate a little a little meetup while 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 we're at Bio. I've, been to many a bio event. Those are those are fun. Yeah. Were were you uh, at, at, just out of curio curiosity at J.P. Morgan recently? In I did not. You know, this was one of the first years in like five that I didn't go. I had I had some other conflicts, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I wasn't I wasn't there in San Francisco this January. Were you there? I was there. Uh, it's when the when the uh, the deluge occurred when it rained for days. So it was it was quite different than what it had been in, in the years before. And I then know. it was you know, post COVID. So it was, it didn't have the same, you know, look and feel to, to past years. But yeah. what's good is you meet people from around the world that are smart doing interesting things and you learn a lot just having lunch on the street corner. <laughs> Absolutely, it's kind of, it's fun that way. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, Raymond, listen, congratulations on all of your success. And, and as you know, one oncology entrepreneur to another, thank you for your contribution to this world. We need, we need more of us. Uh, <laughs> developing new technologies and drugs to solve this huge problem. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I applaud you as well. You know, I, I, I view what we do. I always have viewed what I do. But I, and I think others like us as conductors in, of the orchestra, right? We don't have to play first chair. We don't have to play every instrument. We just need to, we need to harmonize everything. We need to put the right people in the right chair to move them in the right direction so that you have the full impact of what that potential is. And uh, it takes people like us to do that. And it takes people that we choose to surround ourselves with. Yeah. To make it happen as well. I agree. I, I love that analogy. I think back to the beginning of our discussion, talking about foreign languages and, and uh, you know, your, your speaking ability increases as you learn to listen and learn to hear. And I, and that, that, you know, that relates well to, to 
harmoni harmonizing. I'm also a lover of music and have a daughter who went to Berklee College of Music. And Lovely. Yeah, there, there's a lot of similarity between understanding the, the sounds and the harmonies of music and how it fits together with languages, but also I think overlying that analogy as you just did to the world of science and 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 leading a science company is is really quite applicable. Um, Indeed. Raymond, thank you again for your time today and joining me on the CancerVax CEO chat. I wish you guys all the best and look forward to hopefully connecting in June. Thank you, Ryan. And you as well. You as well. Take thank care. You. Thank you.